Hello. Welcome. My name is Ruthie Serene. Down at the end of the table, we have Dr. Eric Goralnik. We are the co-chairs of the SAM Disaster Medicine Interest Group. And we are honored to welcome the speakers on our panel today to discuss the 2017 shootings in Las Vegas. I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Deborah Cools. She's a professor of surgery at UNLV School of Medicine. She's a trauma surgeon and a board certified, is board certified in general surgery and critical care. She's also the program director of the UNLV Surgical Critical Care Fellowship and medical director of University Medical Center's Trauma ICU. Also joining us, we have Dr. Jim Preddy. He's a clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine at the UNLV School of Medicine and an adjunct professor of anatomy at Toro University. You can find his lectures online. We also have with us Dr. J.D. McCourt. He's the medical director of the Adult Emergency Department at UM University Medical Center, Las Vegas. He's an associate professor and serves as the vice chair of clinical operations at University of Las Vegas Medicine Department of Emergency Medicine. And with that, please welcome Dr. Deborah Cools. Good afternoon. It's really nice to see so many of you uh, present, and I would say so many young uh, either attendings, medical students, or residents in the audience. Uh, it's, um, I hope you um, enjoy our talks. I'm going to just fly through my slides. Okay, so I was one of the trauma surgeons that was on call um, the night of the shooting. I don't have any um, disclosures to make that are financial. I am very involved in the firearm injury prevention um, activities of the American College of Surgeons, and I chair the Injury Prevention Committee. So what was my role on 1 October? So I was actually um, kind of the, the day doc, um, and I've been at UMC um, actually since I finished my fellowship. It's a standalone trauma center. It's a phenomenal facility with great care. Um, I manage the ICU, and I think you heard other other things that we all do in collaboration as as a team. So I was actually the day doc, uh, but we were so busy that I I and my two residents were still there after 10 p.m. when the action started. So we actually had two trauma surgery teams in house. So we had the um, evening shift as well, um, and. I worked in conjunction with the trauma director and the um, actual on-call trauma surgeon. So you're here. You know that we are the entertainment capital of the world, right? Um, and we just have millions and millions of visitors um, every, um, really every year and every day, as, as you've experienced, no doubt. But we're physically isolated. Um, if you go outside of Las Vegas uh, very, very far, you're going to be literally in wilderness. And um, even though we're 20 by 40 miles, um, we're isolated from the other major cities that are several hours away. What does our trauma system look like? We like to think that we're a coordinated trauma system. Um, we conduct daily operations. Um, there are many meetings, many events in Las Vegas, um, and we uh, try to staff up to those, and we, we believe that we're adaptable. Um, and our whole trauma system practices disaster response. I think you'll get some comments on that from um, my co-panelists as well. We have six public uh, fire services, three, three private, one fixed wing, one rotor wing. Um, I'm always in receipt of people um, from those, um, those pre-hospital um, assets that we have. So we have 17 regular hospitals, not including the standalone, um, newly popping up, um, quote, hospitals. Um, they all have emergency departments, and they're all capable of caring for um, injured patients. We have three trauma centers, a level one, a level two, and a level three. I work at the level one. I think all of us work at the level one. Um, but we do have a level two that's close by and a level three that's down past the airport. So this is kind of what our valley looks like. I've superimposed green dots where all the hospitals are. And the green dots are non-trauma center hospitals. The yellow diamonds are where the uh, trauma centers are, the level one, the level two, and the level three at the bottom. This is where the shooting occurred. So this just kind of gives you sort of a lay of the land. Um, so what was the timeline? Most of you know these details as well, if not better than we do. But um, if, if, you, if you look just down the street, you'll still see that 17-acre site. Um, and there were over 20,000 people present. It was staffed uh, for a large event um, by Metro and also EMS. 
Um, and within about 13 minutes, over 1,100 rounds were fired, um, on, mostly um, into the crowd. And this happened, this started about 10.08. At 10.25, the first patients start to arrive at Sunrise Hospital, which is the level two, and it's, it's the closest of the trauma centers. About three minutes later, patients started to arrive at our hospital. 80% was, were self-directed and about 20% by EMS. Um, it's been hard to get final numbers on, on, on even the number of injured because many went to the surrounding states. They literally got out of Dodge. So this is just kind of a, a map that you'll see again, um, the Mandalay Bay corner unit, um, and you see the, the large red 17-acre um, concert facility. Now I have a little um, yellow marker off to the right, um, and that's part of the airport property that we'll get to. Most of you have seen these images. I haven't included any video. Um, literally the concert goers um, fled um, to the best of their ability, carrying, the, carrying many times the wounded, protecting others, jumping the fence, um, and then we don't know who is actually alive or dead in pictures like this. These people, this person appears to be dead. These people appear to be dead. Um, and, you know, it was really graphic for all of our country and the world to see these, these videos. Um, and it was really hard for us um, who are local also. This is kind of a, a, a heat map of cell phone activity. So the people kind of around the fence were, we think, non-paying guests. Um, as the shooting occurred, you'll notice that there was, there was some shots that were fired outside of the concert area, and that's in the airport property. Um, uh, shooting, um, actually fuel tanks as well. As the shooting went on, the crowd dispersed largely in a north and an east manner. The westward, uh, all, all of the roads were closed, so that's why they didn't go west, to, to, which would be to the left on your map. And then farther down, we see some people on the airport property, and in fact, one of the dead was found on the airport property. So you'll notice that where the crowd went was, was in the direction of the level two trauma center, and then there were also um, some non-trauma center hospitals, one that will become notable. Um, this was one of the, the shots um, that uh, did not penetrate the fuel tank. So where do we all work? We work in a level one trauma center. It's a standalone facility. Any of those, any of you who are familiar with shock trauma, it was designed after shock trauma. So it's sort of a hospital within a hospital. The only one of its kind west of the Mississippi. Um, and we have a 24 hour in-house trauma surgeon and ED physicians. That's how we know each other. We all work together on a regular basis. So we, we treat about 12,000 annually a year. In the trauma center, we admit about 3,400. I'll mention our joint military-civilian partnership a little bit later. So where were we? Um, so this was the Route 91 Music Festival, as you can tell, Mandalay Bay, the concert area. The quickest way to our hospital was the freeway. Well, the freeway was closed very quickly. Now, it was open to emergency vehicles, but as we just mentioned, a lot of the people were self-transported. So they had trouble getting to our trauma center. So what's, what is kind of the layout um, of, our, uh, of our facility? So that's kind of an overall map. At the top of the map, you see the trauma center entrance. Um, to, to the bottom and left, you see the emergency department entrance. And we give you, I give you sort of the total beds, so we're a little over 500 beds. Um, at that time in the adult emergency department, um, we had 59 beds um, and um, initially a triage area. We have multiple um, physicians, residents, PAs working there. Down at the bottom, we have main ORs. We have 20 of them um, and the PACU, and all of that will become relevant in a, in a minute. So what's inside of the trauma center? Well, we have 11 trauma beds um, in our trauma bay area. And they're in blue. The red is our blood bank. We have three operating rooms, a 14-bed trauma ICU. We have our own CAT scanner, our own angio suite. We also have a recovery room. Um, and we used all of those facilities that night. 
So again, I, w I was there um, thinking I was going home shortly, and we basically had a no-notice mass casualty event. In the trauma resuscitation area, there are 11 beds, nine of them were, were full. Um, and um, my role, I worked along with um, those who were assigned during the night, um, the multiple emergency medicine attendings, many residents, the trauma director, and so forth. I was the senior surgeon through most of this, so when we received our initial wave, I was the person who declared two of our three patients dead and designated expectant. Um, we only had one expectant patient. Those, that, those were very difficult decision, decisions. So right away, and this is part of our disaster plan, our emergency medicine physician who's on in-house in the trauma center set up this triage area along with security. And this was a photo taken that night. So what did our notifications look like? Well, around 10, 15, there's an active shooter on the strip who didn't know quite what to make of that, just that I shouldn't go home. And then we heard five to 10 patients coming our way, and then 20, and at 20, the other trauma surgeon and I looked at each other, we called in backup surgery that happened to be an active duty um, trauma surgeon. We also called in backup anesthesia. We opened up the three operating rooms that I just showed you. The next notification we got was 50 to 100 patients or more. So we asked the unit secretary to activate the disaster plan, and we'll talk a little bit about communications, which were problematic that night. So the initial waves and, and additional notifications. So the, the, you know, I'm really so proud of our nurse managers. They knew exactly what to do. They didn't ask myself or, to my knowledge, the other attendings there. They immediately moved our nine patients in recess back to the PACU area. And we opened up the three ORs, um, and all of a sudden, I think out front they went from zero to 40 patients in five minutes. I've had long discussions with the emergency medicine physician who was on that night. What I know is that we got, I thought we went from zero to 20 in five minutes. And they came in, we double booked, we double bedded um, uh, patients. Throughout the night, there were multiple um, reports of uh, multiple shooters on the strip. And then there was a false notification that there was an active shooter in the hospital when actually our mayor had just walked through, um, through the door. So I'm just going to outline patient flow. So again, we were very fortunate that people knew to set up a triage area outside of recess. Um, so we were not deluged with, uh, with patients um, right off the bat. So there was this outside triage area. The really um, badly injured patients that looked like they might need the OR or blood immediately went into the trauma resuscitation area. Um, some went um, from there to the, to the ICU, although most went directly to the operating room, this operating room and others. Those that appeared to be less injured initially went into a long hallway that we'll show you. So I think one of the really smart decisions, and I wasn't the person who made this, it was, I believe, our trauma director, uh, we needed to create more beds to basically evaluate and further triage patients. So. Um, that, the most critically ill went to the top area in recess and, and to the adult ED, and you'll hear more about that in a little while. Um, one of the dead went directly to the adult ED as well. We mobilized our same-day surgery area, the ASU, um, and our post-operative care unit as additional um, ERs, if you will, and we had the staff to staff them appropriately. So we increased our ER beds without double bedding by 66%, um, literally within minutes. This photo was taken the night of the shooting. Um, again, the charge nurses knew what to do, and the charge nurse actually just called the last three people on her cell phone. And, the, and other nurses came in um, on their own. It was during the news hour, so people in the community knew what was happening to some extent. And part of our disaster plan is that um, the in-house areas go down to a skeleton crew, um, and the nurses who reported to recess, they were told to put in an IV and hang a bag of IV fluid and treat pain, which I think was really wise. We also have in-house pharmacists 
that, that came and then they went to each of the other areas that I mentioned. And I would just say there was phenomenal collaboration. There were a lot of people there, but we didn't get into each other's way. Um, and as far as I know, there was really no questioning of authority and so forth that everyone really um, collaborated for the good of the patients. So what happened in terms of timeline, one of my partners put this together. At zero minutes, we had two faculty and we had multiple residents um, in-house. At 30 minutes, we had four faculty um, and a couple of fellows plus residents, one hour up to five, uh, two hours up to eight. And these are surgical faculty. Um, you can see later on in the evening, we actually sent people home because we did not get a second wave. So what did we do in recess? Um, we largely re-triage people. So it was a secondary triage area. People who needed blood, people who needed procedures, people who needed to go to the OR. We did some workup, but not much. Um, and at one point during the night, we had eight operating rooms running concurrently with multiple specialties present. We don't have residencies in all of these specialties, so many of the attendings were in-house as well. I mentioned the SMART program, so we had um, physicians and other healthcare um, providers of ev really every specialty who came in to help. Many non-surgical services volunteered. I would say we all worked together, our residents worked together, and they continue to work together well that night. This is the long hallway. We had many teams, we had enough staff so that we had a trauma surgeon, emergency uh, physician, anesthesiologist, a pharmacist, nurses, RTs, and residents in each one of the areas that I talked about. Families went to the cafeteria. We had lots of social service um, people and chaplains that came in as well. So we did lots of procedures, um, and including crikes that night, IOs, chest tubes, large central lines, cortices. We did over 20 damage control operations that night um, in really every body cavity. Um, and we canceled all elective cases. So Monday, which was the following day, there were a lot of take backs to the OR. I mentioned our SMART program. Uh, again, there are multiple surgeons, there are emergency medicine physicians, anesthesiologists, orthopedic surgeons, techs, and, and so forth. So it's really a robust team. They all came to help. Um, and um, I highlight Dr. Snook, who was the commander of the SMART program at that time. He's now joined our faculty, and Dr. Files, our trauma director, who some of you probably know. So all total, we got 104 patients. Um, we admitted 60, over 20 surgeries the, um, the night of. 12 went to the ICU. We got 21 patients transferred in. We didn't transfer anyone out, and we only went through 70 units of blood. And we've looked at that, and perhaps some of my colleagues will make comments on that. I think a lot of the people with really life-threatening injuries, they just did not make it to a hospital. They just died largely at the scene. So it's important, like, what does the next day look like? You need to have a fresh team come in, as we did. We did a huge sign out, and internists, the MICU team, the hospitalists, they all came up to us and said, we can help, just tell us what to do. We transferred a lot of our non-critical patients, actually, to their service, because at that time, we still didn't know if there was going to be some sort of retaliation or a copycat. Um, and the media was overwhelming. Um, I was caught up with media until about 3 p.m. the next day, um, and I left about that time, and I slept until Tuesday morning. So what happened Tuesday morning for me, um, we had a several hour long debrief with all of our residents and attendings. The chair of psychiatry was there, um, and it was really a sad day to reflect upon what happened. I got my first look at all the donations. Um, our block was outlined with cases of water, I'm told. I was home sleeping by that time. There were don donations everywhere, and they went on for weeks. And then we heard that we're getting a White House visit. And while we're honored to get a White House visit, I mean, we had not even at all, I mean, recovery is, um, is, is not, not even a total, totally relevant term at that point. So the next day, we had a White House visit that lasted for several hours in both preparation, the actual visit, and the aftermath. Um, and I, I would say that all of our elected representatives were, were very empathetic and sympathetic uh, towards our patients. Um, they spent a lot of time with our patients. Um, so we were honored, but it was a very, very stressful week. 
Um, and I think we'll probably take questions at the end, and that's the end of my comments. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jim Preddy, and I am kind of nobody. Um, I'm just an ER doctor. I'm not the vice chair of anything. Um, uh, I uh, was home that night with my wife. It was the first time we'd seen each other. I had uh, not seen her all week long. We went out to dinner that night because that was the first time we'd be able to see each other, and I had worked the night shift before and stayed up all day that day. And then you guys know how it is. And then. Um, we finally got home, it was about 10 o'clock at night, about 10, 10.30 at night, and this happened. Whoa. I just used the downward arrow. There we go. So um, I get a phone call from my best friend. Uh, my best friend is a SWAT guy. His daughter had been shot at a country music festival and that they were taking her to UMC. Her boyfriend was a uh, um, paramedic for the, for the city. He was like a city firefighter paramedic. And he was holding pressure on her wound in the middle of the crowd and told him that they were going to get her to UMC. So that's all he could tell me. Now, my fr poor friend, for like the first time ever, him and his wife actually went away for their anniversary. They were in San Francisco. So he's a SWAT guy during the largest mass shooting in history, and his daughter's been shot. So he is losing his mind. He calls me, I say, hey, you know, no problem, we're on our way. I just moves itself. Um, so uh, the thing is, my wife is a coroner investigator. She has been on for 18 years. She's the one. We get in the car, we start to drive away, and her cell phone rings. And then her other cell phone rings. And her bosses tell her that there are 30 bodies in front of Mandalay Bay, and she needs to come in right away. So me, I was thinking like some idiot pulled out a boot gun in the middle of a concert. How on earth do you get shot at a country music festival? So now this seems crazy. I take her back to her house, and I drive to work. When I get there, everything's crazy. There are people outside the trauma center. I drove up outside the trauma center and was able, just because people knew me when I got out of the car, and I had a uh, shirt, one of our uh, uh, uniforms that I was able to throw on to look like I belong there. I went in, and they were doing triage. I was not helping, meaning like I just, there's nothing for me to do. I'm not on, and I'm not on the clock, and so I didn't know what to do. So I came in, the first thing I started doing was I started taking tellies. Like, what do I need to do? Take tellies. Okay, so I went over and just started taking tellies, and we weren't doing the whole, like, you know, you know, uh, tell me this about this person, and how old are they, and whether the vital signs. It was how many, when are you going to get here? That's it. Because they were just continuing to come, and as long, the longer you stayed on the radio, the more you were blocking the traffic. So just tell me how many you're, com you're coming with, and then shut up. So... Um, it was crazy when I walked in the door. You've all, we've all seen this kind of trauma. We've just never seen this many people in one place having this many traumas. There's somebody who's up against the corner with a chest wound who's waiting to be seen, who's fine, but would be the center of attention any other day of the week. But tonight, you're going to sit in the corner because they're doing crikes and cracking people's chests over on the other side. And these people on this side of the room were absolutely silent. They made no noise. Meanwhile, on the other side, two or three traumas are going on, full traumas are going on at the same time. So uh, one of the great things that I thought was that um, my boss's boss was there. Um, the director, he was the chief of staff, and the director of the, the uh, trauma center were both there doing nothing. They were not trying to triage. They were not trying to see traumas. They were letting their staff do everything. They were putting out fires. I want this many gurneys down this hall. Uh, that's an OSHA violation, sir. Uh, I want gurneys down this hall. Yes, sir. <laughs> right? Um, CT saying, I'm sorry, we're not doing any of these CTs. Nobody has any labs. And my boss calling, calling up and going, <laughs> 
my boss calling him up and going, son, do you know who this is? Yes, sir. You're doing all of the CTs tonight. You're writing down my name and my number and what time I told you to do this. Yes, sir. So, so they were putting out fires and saying what they wanted done instead of doing the triage. You get caught up in that, then you're not helping anymore. They needed to do their big boss stuff, and they did that really well. Um, I was extra. And so what happened very, fairly quickly was that one of, the tri one of the nurses, the one she was talking about, the, the nursing director, says, I need somebody to go to pack you. So the one thing I could do, because I was extra, was I could leave. And what I mean by that is that if you were working that night, there was no way you were leaving that trauma center. Anybody here who could walk out of the trauma center or out of your ER while that was going on? No. But I was extra. And so I was just there. What do you want me to do? We need somebody to go to pack you. I don't know what that means, but I'll go. <laughs> so they had somebody on the, on, in the trauma side who had already been called it, declared expectant. There was somebody over on the ER side who has also already been declared expectant. So I take patient one. Patient one was a, a gunshot wound to the top of her head. She was intubated. She'd already been through the CT scanner. But there was too much attention being paid to her because she had the, basically the big corner bed. And she was still had some pretty heavy bleeding. And so we pull her out of there. And I take a nurse with me. And we go down to PACU. I have no idea where PACU is. <laughs> so we go down to the PACU. And the PACU for us is you know, it's the pre-op and post-op area. Well, in trauma center, they have three, uh, three separate little e uh, ORs. The PACU has nearly 20, depending on the little ones that they have, but at least 15 big ORs. And so because of that, the pre-op and the post-op has, has like beds for 40-something people, all with monitors, and a Pixis that has all ICU-level meds. And so we could bring down a pharmacist with a key, open up the Pixis and just give out meds, okay? Now, what happened was, is I got down there, and it was me and this patient and a nurse, and that's it, because they couldn't open the PACU until they had some doctor show up. So I go down there with the patient, and we write some orders and do some stuff, and this is what I want, and I looked around, I was like, we should bring everybody down here. And uh, so then I go to the ER. When I go to the ER, I get to patient two, Patient two had been carried into the ER through the uh, ambulance bays by her husband, who had gotten into a cab and t carried his wife all the way there. She had a very large defect to the back of her head, which had been wrapped up. She had not been to the CT scanner. She was also declared a, a, an expectant patient. When I picked her up and then walked her all the way back down to the PACU, there were 30 people there now. So. Apparently, I, my great idea, they had already thought of like a long time ago, and they just needed me to be there so they could do that. So now, everybody who's going into the PACU is not anybody who's been shot in the box. They're all people with usually extremity injuries, okay, some abdominal non-penetrating injuries, like they were on the side or they were graze wounds. They were kind of the walking wounded, hand wounds and stuff like that. So I get patient two ensconced in there, and... Um, we start just triaging everybody. And the only thing we could do was take a piece of paper, slap it on their bed. This piece of paper does not leave their bed. Because of the way it was triaged, everybody I saw could talk. And so they could all tell us what their name was. Here's their name. Here's what I want them to get. Okay? The nurses who all came in, everybody has privileges in the PICU. Or sorry, PACU. They can all get in there. So they didn't have to badge in or badge out or whatever. But everybody who came in to help could come down and help. And so nurses just started appearing. What do you want me to do? Hey, I need a line in that lady. Um, can we give her some pain medicine? We'll write it down. So I wrote it down. And then they go over to the, um, the Pixis, and there's a pharmacist there with a big list. Uh, what, what do you want? <laughs> would, you, would you like that with or without? And so he just kept track of everything that he gave out. And it was an open Pixis, and it was brilliant. And we just start re-triaging everybody who comes in. One of the ladies that I got to had a very large wound to her um, right thigh. It was like a big, huge graze wound, and it had peeled her all the way down, uh, all of her skin down, and also got the top of the muscle of the thigh. But when we started cutting her clothes off, we found a little hole under her pantus, and she was tender. And is that a bullet wound, or is that not a bullet wound? So um, this uh, nurse, Art, came, had come and got me, and so I ran back down to the ER. By the way, I had just blown out my knee like three or four months before, and so I'm like hobble running down to the ER grab an ultrasound, steal that, go back down to the, the, to the PACU and ultrasound her and she's got free fluid everywhere in her belly. 
I don't even know what the number is to pack you. I don't know how to call anybody and all the phones are all tied up. So I'm going to have to go back down to the ER and see if I can find somebody who can find a surgeon because of the trauma center is way too far for me to hobble to. So I go down to the ER and right when I went to the ER, Dr. Snook, that guy you saw, Dr. Snook was walking in with his little briefcase and some guy declared his arterial injury there right in the hallway in front of the ER. Um, and so we, me and him held his leg up and we wrapped him up and we got it all tight and we were able to get the bleeding controlled. And then I was like, hey, uh, I hate to do that while you're here thing, but uh, <laughs> I got this girl in the PACU with a gunshot wound to the belly and I think she's bad. And he's like, PACU? <laughs> yeah, the PACU. And so we walk down there and I'm telling the story as we get down to the PACU. We walk up to her bed and um, the ultrasound machine is still on at the head of her bed. And in what I consider the best uh, compliment I have ever received in my entire life, he walked up, looked at the ultrasound, unlocked her bed, and just pushed her to the OR. <laughs> so he went off to the OR. She did get like super tacky when they got her into the OR. Um, she started to really become shocky. Um, he went in and found a small arterial bleed um, and literally just tied it off, sent her back out. The internal medicine people all showed up. And what did they do? Everybody who came out of the OR, hi, how you doing? We're the, the internal medicine people and we're going to admit you. <laughs> right? And just started writing orders. So um, they canceled ORs, called all the anesthesiologists. And one of the great things that happened was that all of the staff came in, meaning all the staff. Because one of the things that would have never happened right was all those surgeries. Because if, if you didn't have EVS staff, your cleaning staff, if they had not come in to turn over those ORs that fast, I think that saved lives that those people showed up that night. Um, so this is about the Pixis thing. So as soon as we got done and he wheeled her off, as he was wheeling her off and into the OR, patient number two coded. So... I go over and, you know, you, we really don't code gunshot wounds to the head when there's no hope. And I saw the size of the defect in the back of her head and we should not be coding this lady, but the internal medicine guys, she had coded and so the internal medicine guys started coding her. I go over, hey, you know, I got my ultrasound right here, let's take a look, there's no cardiac activity, and so I declared her. Um, so the husband, totally distraught. In all of the people we have been triaging over here, the two ICU expectants were right next to each other. Patient two's husband says, listen, our daughter is in the Luxor with her mom watching her. I, I don't know what to do. I can't raise a seven-year-old. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, that's a war zone. You're not getting back there. You need to stay here with our trauma intervention um, uh, volunteer and she will get you back to your family. And she did, she was able to call SWAT, SWAT sent somebody down um, and drove him back to get to his, uh, his child. So um, we then started consolidating. We took that patient down to um, the trauma center so that all of the dead from this incident could be taken care of in the same place. I feel like I'm not talking fast enough. So patient two, or sorry, patient one, her husband, when patient two dies, goes crazy. He starts throwing stuff, getting super angry, screaming at us, listen, I'm a cop, and if I was a cop and you needed me, I'd be there. Where is the neurosurgeon? Right? There's been no neurosurgeon. Nobody has come by. And I was like, listen, I talked to the neurosurgeon, and if the neurosurgeon was here, he would put a little hole in her head to drain the pressure. There's already a little hole in her head, and we just have to wait. If she makes it through tonight, if she makes it through tomorrow, maybe they'll do surgery then. But on the other side, I'm getting, getting phone calls from uh, ICU saying, we're not giving you a bed because we don't know what's happening. This is still going on. There's still hundreds of people getting shot at, which was not true. But people didn't wait for the ambulances. People jumped in a cab, took the cab to Treasure Island, got out of the, uh, the car in front of Treasure Island right here. Goes, wow, this really hurts and pulls their shirt up and they have a bullet wound and they pass out. Now there's a shooter at the Treasure Island. You see how that went all across Las Vegas? People ran across the street, ran into the Luxor, ran into their underground, ran into a room, turned and closed the door. We have a hostage situation at the Luxor. That really happened. The same thing happened in New York, New York. And so all night long, nobody knew it was over. This was over in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, he had run out of guns that worked. He was an idiot who had never shot too many guns at all. 
he had brand new weapons and brand new magazines, and those jam. He fired every gun he had until they jammed, and then he killed himself. But the people who were down there on the field, who I'll get into in a minute, but the people down on the, on the field didn't know that, and so the, the people who were there for a little country music festival were by themselves in the dark for an hour and a half. And so they, nobody knew how many people were getting sent, so no, you can't have your ICU bed. So I'm still there taking care of her. Doc, can you come over here? I got another lady, and I don't think she's doing well. So Art, again, comes over to this lady, and she's got a gunshot wound to the, to the right chest. Um, she's getting really, really tachypneic. She's, you know, started on the monitor. She's on a monitor now, and her heart rate's like in the 130s. And so I'm like, okay, so I don't know if we have any more chest tubes. Go to the ER, see if you can find me a chest tube and a box, because that was what we couldn't find was the boxes in order to hook them up, and get me an 18-gauge needle. And so this little young blonde comes over in resident scrubs going, no, 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 no. I just looked at her. She is fine. She does not need a chest tube. I was like, oh, she's getting really tachycardic, and she says she, she now feels like she can't breathe. So she goes back over and reexamines the patient. She comes back, and she goes, yeah. She looks at the nurse and goes, so give me 200 ketamine, and we'll go ahead and just put in a chest tube. And the nurse looks at her, and he looks at me. This is Major Strike from the Air Force. She's one of our new trauma surgeons. Yes, ma'am. So uh, she had maybe had two or three shifts before that day, and none of them, you know, the, the, she was not in the ER, so this ER nurse did not know her. Um, they did ketamine because it was there, right? Because you're not going to get constant sedation and an extra nurse and all the people and the respiratory therapist to be able to do a sedation. So they put in a chest tube, which was fine. Um, then uh, we kept just re-triaging, re re-examining people. At about that time, that's when all the arterial bleeds started um, declaring themselves. People who thought they just had a gunshot wound to the hand and now started bleeding all over the place, leg wounds that started bleeding all over the place. I have to go help somewhere else because the trauma center was full before this happened. And the people had been pushed down and did not end up in the PACU. They got pushed even out of the PACU down to ambulatory care. Where is ambulatory care? <laughs> I didn't know where it was. And um, so I went down there and had to go around with all these bikers who had been involved in a motorcycle accident, and they had to, get, had to make sure that they all got their CTs, they all got their discharge instructions, got all of their scripts filled and stuff like that. And so then we get to around 7 a.m. And right around 7 a.m., the trauma team from the day starts coming in. They take over Jim, we just from me. One minute left. So we one minute? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm good. Um, uh, they take over from me and I leave the hospital. Now, finally, I can go find my best friend's daughter because she's across the street at Valley Hospital. So um, I have, we've all taken care of gunshot wound patients. We've all seen this kind of stuff. Um, I get across the street, walk into the ER, see her burst into tears. Because I couldn't imagine the conversation I'd have to have with her dad, because I, I don't like her, just so you know, I don't like her. Um, but I couldn't imagine the conversation I would have to have with her mom and her dad if something happened to her and I was working there that night and I couldn't stop it. So she had the awesome TV gunshot wound. It went through her clavicle and out through her shoulder blade, but she did fine. I wanted to give a couple shouts out to the people who were there at the scene who were running the, um, the uh, venue because they were there for so long by themselves before they would allow um, fire to go out onto the scene. Um, I thought they did an amazing job, and more on top of that, there were a bunch of drunks there, a bunch of drunk doctors, a bunch of drunk nurses, a bunch of drunk law enforcement. And when they brought their patients into that triage tent, when she said, no, that's a black, they hit her, they pushed her down, they attacked her, and then she still had to make that person a black. Um, for um, everybody else, I know my time is running out, um, but I just wanted to say that the one great thing that came out of this is that is patient one. She walked out of a hospital in Arizona three months later. That's my time. All right, well, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. J.D. McCord. I'm the medical director at, the, uh, at UMC in the adult emergency department. 
So uh, I was asked, uh, first of all, my first disclosure is I'm probably the only speaker to talk on this event that actually wasn't at the event. So that's my first disclosure. I was uh, working a freestanding uh, emergency department that night that we staff also. I had a thought of leaving there, and I'm glad I didn't because, uh, you know, a breach of contract, things like that. But it was very, felt very guilty and, and very frustrated that I, I couldn't uh, break out of there. I did send some of our staff that actually also were our trauma nurses there. I think this is kind of, so I'm sitting there that night in the freestanding, and I get this text from one of my colleagues. And the first thought I, I thought of when I read this is, what the hell is this guy listening to the police scanner for on a Sunday night? But uh, anyway, he sent me this, and this was my first uh, knowledge that something was going on. The minute we turned the TV on, it was a full-blown uh, MCI. So uh, again, uh, you know, I, why do you guys want to hear from someone who wasn't there? Uh, it's just like you, you guys want to hear Sully talk about the miracle on the Hudson. Uh, you don't want to hear from this guy, right? Anyone know who this is? It's, that's Jeff Skiles, the co-pilot. He, he doesn't have a movie. Um, <laughs> I, I think what was interesting, when I looked this up, I read about the, the discussion between the co-pilot and the pilot and the movie coming out, and it actually does have some similarity to, to when your department gets thrown into the spotlight in the nation. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of personalities change, so it was just interesting. So, so it really, and, and I've been asked to speak on this, and a lot of us who weren't there shy away. We do not want to, we feel guilty we weren't there. And then I, I finally decided, you know, this group, disaster interest group, you know, maybe I'll give it a try. I, I, my goal here is to at least get, impart some information to you that you might not have gotten, or you may know it all, but I think it's just from my perspective may help you. So I'm going to go for it here. So my, these are my responsibilities. I think your standard medical director responsibilities. The key is proper staffing, hiring, uh, getting a team together that, is, that can function. And uh, you, you add that to anxiety. As a medical director, when you think of an MCI or a disaster, we all get anxiety. It's like, you know, I, I've been standing at our facility watching a disaster drill and in my head going, oh my God. And, uh, and I'm serious, you know, I started thinking about this and being in Vegas, I, I am not naive to think that something like this is not gonna happen again. I'm very concerned that it may uh, and so I get anxiety. So back in 2013, with this anxiety, I developed a, uh, 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 a stipend position for a disaster director. And that person, uh, and my goal was, there's just way too much on my plate that I'm not gonna be able to focus time to get a disaster plan, meet with the disaster planning committee, all the stuff that's required for this. So I, so I put a, a disaster planning director in place and that was 2013, and, and the major reason was is the anxiety that I have. So, and I would assume that many of you out there, if you're EMS directors or uh, medical directors, have the same anxiety. In 2016, the uh, Pulse nightclub in Orlando uh, disaster occurred, and, uh, and I received an email from one of the hospital association people who just was on a conference call about that event, and it was before any of the after action information came out. This is two months after, so this is, uh, I think, uh, August of 2016, so two months after, and, and you couldn't get the action, uh, after action plan because it was a terrorist event and everybody had a court order not to discuss it because it was still a terrorist issue. So I got this email and I read through it, it was, it was a, about a conference call going through, it's pretty much the action, after action plan in the email and I read it and my anxiety again went off the hook. It was very interesting. I thought it was just all the unforeseen things that can happen at, at, this, at their event and just how, how probably not prepared we are. So, so again, I, I took this email and it's kind of funny, this is August 2016, if you look at the, I sent it to our disaster director, and the first line is, wow, this is my biggest nightmare. And my idea here was I wanted to get the residents on board a healthcare delivery project that would really design a, a, a really easy, simplistic disaster plan 
that can go in effect very quickly. Unfortunately, uh, the project was halfway done when uh, this occurred. And of course, this is my worst nightmare, and I think everyone's, uh, a major MCI uh, that occurred. Um, so this is just kind of, you've heard, much, you know, uh, the numbers, they they're fluctuate. So 58, 59, if you include the shooter dead, and then up to 900 patients, 850, 900 uh, injured. So you th you're working in an ED on that night, and you know you are probably not going home early that day. So, uh, so my perspective here for you is, uh, is, is as a director, is it's, it's no different than a coach watching a game film and, and looking at everything. It could be the, a winning game, but the coach is going to critique it and find places so you can improve. The best teams watch the game film and, and figure out where they had some problems and where, where they can improve. So, so pretty much this is my perspective to you. I, I spent, the, the, if you're a medical director, the, the work of a mass casualty incident begins day, the next day, and it doesn't end. It is a huge amount. So hopefully what I've kind of picked up, probably a lot of you guys, since you have a, a huge interest with uh, disaster, probably know a lot of this, it's kind of interesting. I'm, uh, don't really ever had any big interest in disaster, and and now after watching this, I, I wish I had more. Uh, so, so the first thing, I, the the first learning point here is is triage. Setting up triage is a cornerstone of how successful your your plan is going to be. If it's disorganized, slow, dis, you know, haphazard, the entire disaster response will be horrible. I guarantee you. So, so basically, if you're going to go tomorrow and just figure out, I'm just going to focus on our disaster plan, my advice would be figure out how to set up a triage system totally within five, ten minutes. So if you got that down, you, you are, are on total, you're ahead of the game. It basically will set the tone to the response, the success of the response. So, so rapid setup is, is really what I, I look at. And the best example of, with this event is that you look at our EMS system here. Look at this. Nine, so the, the players in the pre-hospital response, nine law enforcement uh, uh, units or agencies, four different fire departments, and three private ambulance uh, services. You just look at that. How could anyone orchestrate a, a synchronized uh, pre-hospital triage setup? It's amazing. And these guys did it. So th these are the guys to learn from. They, they base, and if you go you read through their after action, they found all kinds of places where they can improve. But the fact what they did to, to mass these, this bunch of agencies within 10 minutes or even less of the event is, is amazing. So with any MCI, there's going to be that transition. So you just cross your fingers that the the ICS at the scene works, that, that they pull it off, and then they, and, and, and any MCI, the transition's gonna occur where it goes from pre-hospital to hospital. And that's when your hospital MCI, you, you know, if you put yourself in my shoes, oh please, I hope they can pull this off. And, and you don't know. So uh, this picture was already shown, and there's a bunch of issues with triage. triage I, everyone who does a disaster drill, don't you all wait around in front of the ambulance bay and you wait for the moulage patients to show up in the ambulance bay? That ain't the way it's going to happen, let me tell you. There's, there's all kinds of factors, road closures, all kinds of factors, location to where you are from the incident, so that's going to change. So uh, the, the first, some of the data, there was approximately 900 injured uh, uh, patients. Within uh, the first uh, hour, 200, approximately 200 were transported by ambulance. Okay, so that's the first hour. There's another 650 patients that are, are coming to the facilities. So, so the first thing I wanna say is there's a couple of ingredients to a smooth triage setup. The first one is a constant. It's having well-prepared, well-trained staff. Then there's a, a couple of variables, and we'll talk about, but, but the uh, well-trained, well well-experienced team. 
And that's, that's a constant, but that's an unknown, because we've never gone through this. So I'm sitting at a freestanding going, gee, I don't remember ever at a department meeting going over the disaster plan or going over any of that stuff. So I was on edge on that one. Anybody know, does this look like October 1st, 2017? No, this is yesterday. This is our ambulance bay at 3 o'clock every day. So when you ask well-trained, well-prepared staff, we go through a disaster every day on shift. We see over 250, 300 patients a day. We are at peak flow capacity almost every day at 3 o'clock. So we basically become uh, wingatologists. We know how to wing things, I'm telling you. And, and this is just from the day-to-day -day experience. So I'll tell you, if you're at a busy ED, you should, you should embrace this and try to figure out, use these periods. These work better than a disaster drill, as far as I'm concerned. So, so how you, you have operations for efficiency, moving patients, supplies, this is where you learn it. The other, uh, so the other thing we had built into our system is a, we have a physician in triage, we call it rapid medical assessment. And basically what that is, it's, it's your doctor in triage to get the door to doctor time quick. But really what that is, is 200, a, a doc will work there in 10 hours, see over 100 patients, and their goal is sick or not, you know, you're seeing patients, sick or not sick, resources, no resources, dispo or admit right? So it's funny, you're learning triage every day doing that shift. I just want to give you one minute, Jenny. Okay. Uh, variables, the other variables are the uh, uh, number of arrivals. So if you think your, uh, your arrival uh, pattern is going to be uh, traditional, it won't. It'll be totally haphazard, like I said. Um, and this was, in our case, we had Uber, trucks, they, they came from everywhere. The other issue is that you need to know on a variable is how many access points you have at your hospital. If you got 10 like we do, you are going to have triage popping up everywhere. We have two EDs with two uh, uh, ambulance uh, drop-offs, so of course you're going to have two triage centers. That, that's probably always going to be the way. And then you have to realize your, your signage, and that, this is just an inherent problem in our system. This, one of my colleagues took this picture. It's the most ridiculous signage I've ever seen. <laughs> so you add all those variables, put them together, and this is what you get. You have patients arriving every, every area, and the problem with this is you'll develop more than one triage area. You'll, your disaster plan has a design place, but they'll show up everywhere. The big problem too is it'll, it'll, it'll split your uh, supply, uh, your equipment, your staffing. So that is one major thing you need to look for. And I, these red dots here, and it's, I'll go quicker through this. When you see this red, that's my, that's my sticky point to say disaster plan for future. If I'm gonna focus on something, I'm going on this. I'm working with security. You need to round up these patients and funnel them to the, our pre-designated triage area. The other problem with that I showed you is, you imagine if this was a hazmat issue, the contamination would have been a, a, a total disaster. So the other, the triage system, I think you guys all know the, the start pro, uh, process, or we used uh, IDME, which is uh, the immediate, it's, it's really the red, yellow, green, black tagging system. The, the, the key though is you gotta pick a very simplistic uh, triage process. And the reason being is, some docs are not going to know it, and you're going to have to be able to explain it to them very quickly on the fly. And this is, I would recommend this. You need a triage is about sorting. If you have no pre-designated place to sort the patient, then you're just triaging patients and leaving them at the same place. So you need to pre-designate where, where you're going to send these patients. The next issue is a disaster, is a supply issue. This is always going to be a running problem. Uh, we have three disaster carts, and not a surprise to me, they couldn't find them that night. How, who uses disaster carts? Okay. All right, uh, so the disaster cart issue, uh, they didn't know where they were. My recommendation, and this is some of the information pre-event uh, of stocking, and I, I just look at it, I go, one uh, easy I.O. driver, that would be not enough. So 
Um, so right there, there's uh, some issues. So my, my point here would be consider stocking your pre-designated areas. So triage really would be uh, personal protective equipment and basic life support equipment. I do not need 10 cordis kits out in an ambulance bay with no lights. I, I don't know who's going to do that. So, so you really got to stock. I, I want all that equipment in, in the PACU or, or the trauma resuscitation area. So, so basically stock to where you're going to send these patients. And yeah, the last thing is the most important thing is a wheelchair for triage. The card rapid registration, that was, didn't work. There was no cards being used. They couldn't find them. The, I, my quick point to here is this is going to be a problem for all of you. It's registration's job to fix it. If it's not fixed, then get on them because I guarantee you it's not fixed at your hospital right now. There should be a rapid way to identify these patients. We lost track of so many patients. So I'm sorry because it's All right. about 4 o'clock and the next group is going to go. Any last uh, statement or? What's that? Any last statement? Uh, no, it's the okay. standard, the communication, the workforce. I will tell you the workforce, you're going to have 10,000 people showing up okay. and how to identify who can do what and who is what is, is a key thing for you. And, and there are some creative ways to figure that out. So uh, first of all, we want to thank uh, JD, Jim, and Deb for their fantastic presentation.